Hey everybody, welcome to Zoobox. I'm Sean, and today I'm going to be counting down my top 10 movies of 2022. A little late, I know, um, but I like to kind of revisit some of these titles before I jump in and make my official list. Usually I have a list of like 20, maybe 22 movies, and I try to whittle it down to 10. 10 essential films from 2022. But before we get into our top 10, our essential films, I want to give a little nod, a little, a little cap, a little cap tip there to uh, some honorable mentions, some movies that maybe it wouldn't be for everybody or things that I just thought were a little, a little shy of the mark in terms of something, something that I would include on the list. Uh, a few of these are more like interesting than I would say good or interesting than completely successful. But uh, yeah, let's just get into it. So at number five of my honorable mentions is Dash Cam. Now Dash Cam is a wild, wild found footage movie. It's definitely not for everybody. I could honestly, I could see a lot of people really hating this movie uh, and finding the main character Annie Hardy kind of uh, insufferable. <laughs> kind of insufferable. She is in real life. She's a musician that turned live streamer, and she like dri would drive around in her car, and she got kind of famous for making like up rap songs and just being kind of crazy she's kind of like a crazy bipolar musician person personality and uh for some reason they they latched onto her to star in this really intense found footage movie it's a lot of uh, a lot of cell phones a lot of gopros uh things of that nature because you know the character being a live streamer just kind of incorporates a little bit more naturally i mean you got to suspend your disbelief as you have to with most found footage movies but it's a wild ride. It's like a roller coaster. Uh, I had a lot of fun watching it. Um, I tried to show it to my wife. That's why I kind of know it's not for everybody, and she could barely get past 20 minutes. She just could not stand the lead character. So, like I said, it's not for everybody, but if you're into the genre, if you're into found footage films, if you're into kind of wild horror movies, I would say definitely give it a go. I think it's better than most people will give it credit for because it doesn't seem like most people could get past Annie Hardy and Annie Hardy's personality, but there's a lot of fun stuff in the movie, and I, I would definitely give it a recommend for those that are into that kind of thing. Uh, my number four honorable mention is Barbarian. Now, Barbarian, from what I understand, is directed and even, I think, written uh, by one of the, the cast members of The Whitest Kids You Know. Um, it's a psychological thriller horror film um, that's trying to be kind of subversive and interesting. I think it's kind of half successful. It's social commentary at this point is a little stale. Apparently the script was written like three or four years ago, maybe even longer than that. Uh, the guy's been trying to get it made for a while. So it is definitely a labor of love for him. Uh, I don't think it connects on everything. And like I said, I feel like the subtext, the social commentary has become a little tired um, at this point. Like, I don't know how many horror movies I need to see that just says like, oh, like men are kind of creep assholes and even nice ones. Even the ones that seem like they're nice, they're also kind of creepy and predatory. And, uh, oh, we'll see what happens. And then it kind of, like, it's very muddled. It kind of gets very mixed up. It's a movie I'd like to uh, revisit, actually. I've only watched it one time back when it originally came out. I went into it completely blind, which if I, I would suggest, if you haven't seen it yet and you don't know anything about it, also go into it blind. That's definitely going to be the best way to experience that movie. But, um... I thought it was directed very well. That's why it's on the honorable mention list. It's it's a it's it's impeccably directed. Uh, it has a really great pace. It has a great control of tone, um, and there are some legitimately some really fantastic, fun, thrilling, even kind of scary moments in the movie. Even if it all doesn't kind of make sense or add up to anything super substantial by the end, uh, there's a, there's some fun stuff in there, and uh, it's it'd be an interesting movie to have like a conversation with somebody about. So you know, if you're ever bored on a weekend, you got some friends over, everybody's having a beer or whatever. I think Barbarian's on, uh, I think it's on HBO Max. Give it a go. Give it a go. It'll inspire interesting conversation, if nothing else. And number three for my honorable mentions is Triangle of Sadness. Um, I can't remember the director's name. I know his, his previous work is Force Majeure and The Square. Um, and I think he's he definitely has something else in there that I'm it's eluding me at the moment. But this is kind of like a very, very on the nose, very direct class commentary movie about rich people and poor people and servants and, and the help, etc. And um, it's pretty good. Like, it's directed very well. It's another example of a movie that's kind of on here because it's directed impeccably well. It's paced perfectly. It's like two and a half hours long, but it's a very quick two and a half hours. 
Uh, my one big criticism of the movie is like within about 40 minutes, the movie has kind of made its point. It's kind of done what it's set out to do. And then it just kind of makes that point over and over and over again in different contexts as the movie goes along. Um, the basic kind of story is good enough to kind of string you along to the end of the movie. And um, I, I did find it very entertaining. Like the actors are all great. The direction is very strong. Uh, but I just like, it's kind of like Barbarian. It's like, well, I, how many movies do I need to fucking watch in the <laughs> five year period that make this point? It's just getting a little tired at some, at some point it gets a little tired. And then there's the inherent hypocrisy of people that are in filmmaking that make movies about these kinds of things. I feel like there's, they're a little, uh, especially this guy, he's a little bit more heady. It's a little bit more intellectually minded. Um, but it has a it has a fun sense of humor to it too. It's got this kind of dry, dark, matter of fact sense of humor that I really enjoyed. Woody Harrelson is one of the uh, one of the one of the cast, and and he's really good in the movie. He's a lot of fun. There's also a Greek guy. I can't remember his name. I don't know the actor's name, um, but he's also really good. It's it's worth checking out. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, don't let that time that runtime intimidate you because when I saw it, it stopped me from watching it for a while. I was like, holy shit, two and a half hours of like social commentary. I don't know if I can deal with that. And then uh, one day I just kind of broke and ended up checking it out. And I'm glad that I watched it. I'm glad that I checked it out. Uh, my number two honorable mention is Halloween Ends, the David Gordon Green ending his trilogy. Um, I... I really actually enjoyed this movie. I was this was in, I, this came on and off the top ten actually for me. Um, I think it's an incredibly bold movie. The problem I have with it at the end of the day though is that I'm not sure it all really lands, and it's a little muddled and confused at times. And I think it it it. Uh, I hate to say that they were afraid to kind of just go forward with what they were attempting to do. Um, but I feel like the end is a little bit of a cop-out. Now, I have my own theories about what the movie is doing and what the subtext is, and uh, there's actually a full-length review, I think it's like a half hour long or something, on this channel that I did uh, around the time when it came out. So if you'd like to hear my deeper thoughts in the movie, uh, go check it out there. I do it full spoiler style. Like, I don't want to spoil anything here. So uh, it's definitely worth your time. And it actually, in my opinion, made the other two movies better. Uh, for it existing it just it ties everything together thematically it's not it's the last thing that you're expecting from like a movie called halloween ends that was marketed in the way that it was it's the last movie that you're expecting but if you think about what's been going on in the subtext and the story of the two previous films of this new trilogy uh, it kind of made perfect sense and um i was really impressed with it i thought it was really ballsy that they actually did what they did um, and um, and I appreciate a movie that goes and swings for the fences a little bit, even if it doesn't entirely connect. Uh, and my number one honorable mention, um, I just just watched this the other day. It was All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, this is a pretty good movie. It's a pretty good war movie. One of the better ones that has come out in, in a while, actually. I remember, you know, back growing up, like things like Saving Private Ryan, The Thin Red Line. I grew up watching Full Metal Jacket, Hamburger Hill. I used to just grew up watching a lot of war stuff, but we don't often get to see this type of warfare, trench warfare. I mean, we get to see it a little bit in something like maybe like Paths of Glory, and I'm sure there's other movies out there that I'm either forgetting or haven't seen. Um, and I think this, what this does really well is it gives you kind of this on-the-ground level um, experience of trench warfare and how brutal it was. Uh, my only complaint with the movie is that it's a little... It kind of blows through stuff really quickly. I mean, it's a longer movie. It's like two and a half hours. But, you know, when you got a movie like this, you really got to sit with some of this stuff. And I don't think it does a great job of um, making you feel empathy for the characters in a very, and which is, sounds like such a weird thing to say with a, when you're watching a movie with people that go through such like traumatic, horrific experiences. Um, but like, I just didn't feel like I got to know them well enough. Um, you know, and that's, it's not entirely like that. It comes in fits and starts where you really feel like a sense of connection um, with, with the leads and what they're going through and stuff. Because there are a few quiet moments, I think, um, peppered in there. When the movie would lose me, though, is when it kind of gets into the bureaucracy of the war and what's going on in the more top level. Um, I understand why it's there, but I kind of wish that the entire focus of the movie was just on the soldiers and their plight really just kind of zooming into that experience and just show us kind of some sort of 
like the visceral nature of it, which, you know, it does a pretty good job of. Uh, there's some great cinematography, some really great performances. It's in German. It's a German film. Uh, it's on Netflix. They do a dub. I watched part of it with a dub and then part of it in German. It's obviously better in German, but, you know, I got to say, I got to say, <laughs> the dub was not awful. The dub wasn't awful uh, from what I listened to of it. But, yeah, so those are my honorable mentions. Um, all worth checking out. All worth your time. All right, so let's get into the meat. Let's get into the meat of this list. These are my top 10 films of 2022. Uh, at number 10, Beavis and Butthead do the universe. Oh, my God. This one came on and off. It was in the honorable mentions. Then it was kind of on the list. Then it was back on the honorable mentions. But when I was really thinking about it and I revisited a few scenes before I kind of finalized my list, and I think it's such a miracle that it actually is as good as it is. Um, it's a great Beavis and Butthead adventure. I think it's actually probably better than Do America. And the most shocking thing about it is that it's not directed or written by Mike Judge. Mike Judge came in and did the voices. He was kind of came in as an actor. And I'm sure he had input and I'm sure he ad-libbed and did his thing. Um, but the directors are Albert Kalaros and John Rice. They also, uh, and then the writers are Lou Morton and Guy Maxstone Graham. I was I was so pleasantly surprised by this. There is um, some sequences that are legitimately some of the funniest things that I saw in 2022. Uh, so I was very pleasantly surprised. Like you know, you may have seen if you're if you've been watching the channel for a while. I even occasionally wear a Beavis and Butthead shirt. There's definitely a little bit of a nostalgic pull for Beavis and Butthead for me. I grew up watching it as a kid, and just like most people my age. I'm 36 now. Like uh, you weren't supposed to be watching it. You had to sneak it. I even used to go down, my little brother had like one of those like uh, kid voice recorder things, you know, pop in a cassette tape, close it up, and I, I would have to go over to the TV and I would record episodes, but what I would have to do is I would have to hold in the button on the microphone the entire time, um, but I, <laughs> I would record episodes of Beavis and Butthead um, when my parents were either asleep or when they went out to the store or something or they went out to a party or whatever and I was like babysitting the kids uh, my brothers and sisters and I would I would sneak watch it and record stuff and I would listen to them at night so there's a few episodes of Beavis and Butthead that I know very well, intimately almost know them word for word no no, I'm not going to do it now I'm not a dancing monkey but yeah, Beavis and Butthead I, maybe I'm just as surprised as you are that it's on the list, but it's well worth your time. It's well worth checking out if you're a fan of Beavis and Butthead. And I'd say even if you're kind of only like uh, only somewhat interested in Beavis and Butthead, like if you're not a big fan, but you're like, oh, you know, they're funny. Uh, check it out. I was I was so pleasantly surprised by it. I'm happy. I'm happy to report that it's actually a. Uh, very solid, a very solid film, and it definitely secured um, the top, the top ten spot on on this list. Uh, for number nine, we have the menu. Now, the menu just came out. I don't know what, like a month and a half ago. It's with Re uh, Ray Fiennes, Anna Taylor Joy, Nicholas Holt, and it's about. It, this is another movie that's kind of about class. But the thing that I found most interesting about the movie that it's actually more about art and criticism and what why do you make art who are you making it for what is criticism what is valuable criticism what is like kind of up its own ass criticism um and I think it has like a fun conversation and it does it in this kind of mystery thriller kind of trappings and also with a like kind of dark comedic edge um and it was a very pleasant surprise I didn't know anything about it when I watched it actually because even the poster itself doesn't really give away the game. Um, even what I said here, honestly, is probably a little too much. It's probably a little too much, so I apologize. But it's well worth checking out. There, it has some great twists and turns. It has some great performances. Ray Fiennes is fantastic in this movie. It's one of the better performances maybe of his career and also of the year in general. Um, Anna Taylor-Joy, I just like Anna Taylor-Joy. She's got this weird alien kind of vibe to her. And she's also going to reappear on this list later, but... Yeah, I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised by this, and uh, how about how, especially about how thoughtful it was, um, and I think it kind of sticks the landing. I think it does a pretty good job all the way through, and, and it's in and out. It's kind of a it's under two hours, which is always a good, it's a boon. Under two hour movies are great, especially when you're you know a busy person and you got a life. It's a good stuff. It's a good time. It's definitely worth checking out. Uh, my number eight film 
is Phil Tippett's Mad God, the stop motion animation uh, new classic, I'd say. This has been a labor of love for Phil Tippett. It's been he's been doing this for about 30 years. I think it was around the time he made he did the stop motion stuff, the ED209 for Robocop 2. That he started noodling with this. There's been other various versions of the movie that have played at festivals over the years. Um, I know that there was like a 45 minute version of the movie that played at animation festivals that's been going around for a long time. For a long time. But it wasn't until a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or something like that, that uh, he was convinced to kind of finish the movie. And a lot of people kind of donated their time and effort into getting it done. And I thought it was awesome. I know there are some people that have kind of poo-pooed it a little bit. So they were kind of underwhelmed by the experience. But it's a pure, it's such a pure experience. It's, it's full-on metaphor. It's full-on allegory. There's not even any dialogue spoken. It's just all told through, like, the visuals. And uh, it's kind of the story about, uh, about your purpose in life and your drive and where do you get inspiration from and all of the things that can come in your life to conspire to stop you and destroy you and corrupt you um, and just and that's and that's just kind of icing on the cake because it's just a visual feast it's it's just a fucking rad movie it's the most metal movie on the list the most metal movie on the list it's badass it's right now it's i think it's exclusive to shutter but it's also available on blu-ray but, you know, if you don't know, if you want to just check it out, you can go get a seven-day trial on Shudder. Um, you can just make up an email address. They don't even make you verify anything. You just literally, if you've already had one in the past and you canceled it before Mad God came out and you just want to check it out, you just make up an email address. <laughs> you can get it. And then when you do that, say that you're going to cancel your subscription right away, and they might offer you a free month. I got like two and a half months of Shudder for free. Also, you can just like look up promo codes. Just look up promo code Shutter. And generally, there's like at least two weeks, sometimes thirty days. You can find. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. So that's my uh, that's my number eight. My number seven film is Park Chan Wook's decision to leave. Uh, this one also I watched recently. Um, I'm a big fan of Park Chan Wook. If you don't know his filmography, uh, he's most famous for directing Old Boy. Um, Thirst, Joint Security Area. Uh, the Vengeance Trilogy, though, is probably what he's most famous for, which is Old Boy, uh, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, and Lady Vengeance, uh, which are all, all great movies. And also, from a few years ago, The Handmaiden. This is more in line with something like The Handmaiden. This is probably his most low-key, most subtle one. And in a weird way, maybe his most depressing movie. Um, I, it's such a well-made movie. And it's so kind of enrapturing when you're watching it. You're so I was so locked into it that even though by the end of the movie, it kind of makes an argument that I feel is mildly despicable <laughs> about the human condition and about what people should do once they've kind of moved past this kind of point of no return um, and what how they should deal with that situation. I didn't love the end, but it is such a joy getting there. And it's so meticulously plotted and it has this great idiosyncratic nature it's pure uh park chan wook uh i don't know if it's it's not definitely not my favorite park chan wook movie but it's maybe might be his most like well directed one i mean he just kind of he, he's a guy that kind of just keeps getting better and better like i said most people know him from old boy but i if you if that's all you've ever seen of his movies i would implore you to check out something like the handmaiden or decision to leave um or thirst thirst as well they're they're really cool movies uh, and very well directed movies and they always have kind of an interesting angle there's all you know there's a barrier to entry a little bit because there's it's a korean film there is a little bit of cultural stuff there that might get lost on you but i feel like the movie gives you enough context clues where you can figure it out if you're paying close enough attention um like i said i think it's well worth your time i think it's a very cool movie uh, my number six is a kind of a surprise. Well, probably one of my biggest surprises of the year. I didn't expect to have any feelings about this movie at all. And that is Top Gun Maverick. Yes, Tom Cruise, his boy Joseph Kaczynski. Um, he directed Tom on in Oblivion. Came and directed this. Um, who would have thought? Who would have thought that Top Gun Maverick? It's not only it's, it's I think I've seen it on pretty much every single best of list that I've seen this year. Uh, but who would have thought a movie like a sequel to fucking Top Gun <laughs> like 30 years after the fact 
would be any good. It's it's one of the most viscerally exciting movies I've seen in a long time. I had the pleasure of getting to see this for the first time. I got to see it on IMAX, and my God, my God, what an experience! What a rad theatrical experience. But I'm pleased to I'm pleased to report that it holds up at home too. I thought maybe I was like, oh, there's no way this is gonna feel this fun and this cool at home. Well, it did. It still works like gangbusters. It's just kind of. It's it's very simple and straightforward. It's all archetypal. It's <laughs> it's there's nothing is going to surprise you that happens. But the photography, um, in in and just the the simplicity of the heroes of our having like outwardly heroic characters is actually pretty exciting. And I'm saying this as somebody I'm not a big fan of Top Gun. I'm not a big fan of the Tony Scott uh, Top Gun. I think it's okay. I think it's more of a movie of its era, of its time. I, I understand why people of that time period like the movie, you know, that kind of grew up with it and stuff, but you know, I didn't see it until I was much older, and a lot of it's just kind of lost on me. I think there's a lot of cool stuff in it, um, and I like some of the cinematography, but the movie itself, I think, is kind of whatever. Um, Top Gun Maverick ended up being super fun, super enjoyable. Um, I think it's much better than the original Top Gun myself. Uh, like I said, it's just kind of pure popcorn entertainment in the best way possible. My most pleasant surprise of 2022 for sure. All right, my number five film, now we're into the top five, is Robert Eggers' The Northman. The Northman, I've gone back and forth. When I first saw The Northman in the theater, I was very excited about it. I'm a fan of Robert Eggers. I like The Witch. I like The Lighthouse. I was very interested. So I'm kind of always interested to see what this guy's going to do. Apparently, he's doing Nosferatu. Anna Taylor Joy is coming back for that. And uh, what's, what's that guy's name? That Skarsgård dude, isn't he? Isn't he that other? Not Stellan. Not Alexander Skarsgård. The other Skarsgård, the one from It, the one that played Pennywise. Uh, he, I think he's going to be Nosferatu. Or Shrek. Isn't that the character's name? Back Shrek? Or is that fucking Batman Returns? Oh boy. Anyways, so the Northman. Like I said, I've kind of gone back and forth on this movie. I was kind of lukewarm the first time I saw it uh, because I expected it to be something a little different than it was. Um, It is way more straightforward than I thought it was going to be. But upon subsequent viewings, I've watched it three times. The last time I watched it, I checked it out on 4K. I picked up the 4K during uh, the Black Friday sales for like 10 bucks. Hell yeah. And um, it really connected with me on that third viewing. Um, and what they were doing and what Ro- Robert Eggers is trying to accomplish. And he's just trying to basically just do justice by one of these kind of one of these kinds of stories, one of these kind of Viking mythology stories. Um, I did a review for the movie when it came out. I don't know if it's on the main channel or if it's on Zoobox Forever. Uh, but I did a, re- a review for it and I talked about kind of where it was coming from, the inspiration, or where this, uh, what this has inspired through culture. Because the thing is, Amleth, the story of Amleth, which is the main character that Alexander Skarsgård plays, is the inspiration for Hamlet. Um, so you're going you're gonna to be very well versed, you're going to be very familiar with a lot of the kind of the character archetypes and the story beats, etc. Um, but I think it's just viscerally and visually and and uh, performance-wise, it's uh, it's kind of a, a huge accomplishment that I wish I had <laughs> I had been able to engage with more fairly when I saw it in the theater. I think because it was a Robert Eggers movie, I went into it kind of thinking I was going to need to like deconstruct it or something while I was watching it, and I wish I had kind of just gone in with just a clean mind and just enjoyed it for what it was, but. Anyways, but I, I ended up really coming around to it, really enjoying the film. It's cool. You should check it out. If you haven't seen The Northman and you just want like a baller, <laughs> a baller Viking epic, check it out. You're, you'll probably like it. You'll probably like it. You know, it's got kind of that. It reminded me from back in the day, like when I grew up you know, watching like fucking Braveheart or, or Gladiator or something like that. It feels like it would be in that group of of movies that kind of story um but yeah my number four film of 2022 another kind of big surprise actually is Boz Lerman's Elvis I ended up really loving Elvis I did an I did a long form review of this it's over on our channel Zoobox Forever it's our second channel 
Um, I really enjoyed this. I understand why people didn't connect with it um, because it's not being honest. It's not telling you like a straightforward biography of Elvis's life. It's the idealized Elvis. It's the mythic Elvis. They're mythologizing him. It's Boz Lerman is a big Elvis fan, and basically he's canonizing Elvis into pop culture American sainthood or American pop culture sainthood um, to be something to kind of aspire to and live up to. Uh, they really brush away, they brush aside a lot of the more controversial aspects of Elvis's life and his behavior and kind of in service of making him seem like a god. Um, but as a movie, as a cinematic experience, I thought it worked like gangbusters. I thought it was awesome. I really liked even Tom Hanks. People giving Tom Hanks a lot of shit for his performance as Colonel Tom Parker. Uh, making fun of it or for some weird reason, like as if they didn't understand the movie they were watching. Like everybody is a little heightened. Everybody's a little cartoony. Austin Butler, who does a fantastic job as Elvis Presley, even his is it's a little heightened. It's a little stylized. Everything is. Uh, and it's one of the best times I had at the movies. And, and I got to see it. I actually got to see it in the theater. And uh, I was so surprised with how eclectic the crowd was. And, uh, and that a lot of the people that saw the movie or were there to see the movie were teenage girls. I have to imagine, is Austin Butler involved in some other movie or franchise that is popular? The Carrie Diaries, maybe? Is that where people know him from? <laughs> I know he plays done some bit parts in other movies, but I'm looking here. The Shannara Chronicles, is that what the girls are into? Yoga hosers? Uh, this is his kind of big breakout thing as far as I understand. Uh, but yeah, but a lot of teenage girls. They just watched the Elvis movie. I was like, oh wow, that's crazy. I guess maybe his cultural footprint, footprint and shadow looms a lot larger than I thought it did. Uh, but it's a, it's the kind of movie that you're going to immediately, as soon as it's over, you're going to listen to like some Elvis songs. You're going to go watch Elvis, Elvis concert footage. It just kind of brings that out in you. And uh, it's a great time. It's a great time. Uh, my number three film of 2022 is kind of a companion piece. It's kind of the anti-Elvis. It's Blonde. Starring Anna de Armas as Marilyn Monroe. This is Andrew Dominic's, uh, this is like his fourth or fifth feature. Uh, he directed Chopper, Killing Them Softly, and uh, probably my favorite one is The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford back in uh, 2007. Uh, Blonde is a movie that is there to deconstruct celebrity. So Elvis is a movie that's there to mythologize, to canonize, to build up. This is to basically shove in your face that Marilyn Monroe had kind of a shitty life and that she was taken advantage of at every turn and you, what you are celebrating in some way when you're celebrating her art is you're celebrating her pain her tortured life this has made lots of Marilyn Monroe stands very fucking uncomfortable uh, people are just really childish it's like this is movie it's explicitly for adults it's obviously doing its own thing it's trying some new shit some new shit. I think it. I think for me, it worked really well, because uh, a lot of people have been accused it of being misogynistic. They're saying, "Oh, it's a misogynistic movie." It stops at some point. It stops depicting misogyny and just is misogynistic. No, you're just uncomfortable with the fact that somebody that you kind of that you fucking idol worship, maybe was mistreated, maybe was treated like shit, and because of like cultural pressure, whatever you want to call it, her. her the path that she was on in life, the track that she was on, uh, it kind of kept her going in a certain direction that didn't help her at all. And she never really found that. I mean, she had, she has an awful fucking life story. And I know some of this is fictionalized. It's based on a novel by Joyce Carol Oates from, I think like 2002 or 2003. I've never read it myself, but it's, it was always said, well, it's a fictionalized version of Marilyn Monroe's life. And there's lots of stories and controversy about whether that's true or not, or whether that was like, the estate of Marilyn Monroe trying to protect her legacy, etc. Um, but there is a lot of made up shit in here, 100%. So don't get it twisted because it's in this sense, this is why it's kind of a good companion piece to Elvis because while it's not all true, it's telling the truth. It's telling the truth about Marilyn Monroe, about her life. All the details aren't true, but the sentiment, what you're supposed to take away from it, how uncomfortable you're supposed to feel about it, it's all there done on purpose you know it's all there for a reason uh it's a tough it's a tough watch man it's a really intense movie it's very long 
Um, I like again, it's another movie. I didn't really necessarily feel the length of it, but it's a brutal experience. I'll probably only revisit it maybe once or twice for the rest of my life. It's just not Blonde is not a movie that I need to watch on the reg, uh, but it's a it's an intense experience, and I think it's supposed to be. And in that, I found it very successful. My number two film of the year is Todd Field's Tar, starring the one and only Kate Blanchett. I really like Todd Field's other movies. Uh, he did a movie called Little Children and In the Bedroom, a couple a couple of dramas. This is his first time uh, back in the director's chair in a very long time, I think since Little Children, so maybe like 16 years or something like that. If you don't know him, he's Nick Nightingale in uh, Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> That's who he is. He was, I guess, some sort of actor at one point. But I was so blown away by this movie. Kate, Kate Blanchett giving another just tour de force, fucking burn it down performance. Was some of the best stuff you'll see all year. Uh, maybe ever. Maybe this might be one of her best performances in her entire career. And a career of great performances, this may be the best one. Uh, it's very, it's fully formed. It's idiosyncratic. It, it feels like a different person. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, and it gets into the messy nature of success and status and um, sexual dynamics and men and women and all sorts of stuff and control and uh, the way that we put pressure on each other, the way that we manipulate each other. And it's all kind of through this character of Lydia Tarr. Um, and it's great. It's a it's a fucking intense movie. Another long one, actually. <laughs> it's like two and a half hours long. I mean, there are just really long scenes in the movie. There's like a I think it's like 15 minutes long of her just like teaching a music course, a music class uh, where she like rips into the woke students, which you're supposed to like agree with and also disagree with it for different reasons. And I don't want to spoil anything, but it's a super well modulated movie, perfectly paced, perfectly performed. Um, it almost was my be- up until I saw what ends up being my number one movie. This was my number one movie for a long time, or for the past few months since October. I saw this in like uh, the end of October. So since then, I thought I was like, "Well, man, who the hell is going to come in and beat Tar? How's that even going to be possible?" It's great. You should check it out. You should check it out. I don't think it's available on anything. Uh, it's it's streaming, but not on like any service that you already pay for. Uh, but I, I I assure you, it is worth the six dollar rental. It's it's awesome. It's a fucking rad movie. And finally, we come to our number one film, the one that stole my heart, the one that was better than Tar, The Banshees of Inisherin. Uh, in a phrase, if I were to describe this movie in a phrase, I would say Irish as fuck. The most Irish fucking thing I've ever seen. Um, it's directed by Martin McDonough uh, and written by Martin McDonough, who's like a director, also a playwright. Um, you probably know him from In Bruges, maybe the billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, which is a movie I actually couldn't stand. Seven Psychopaths, but his newest one, Banshee of Sharon, brings back Brennan Gleeson, Colin Farrell, and a beautiful two-hander. And this movie really stayed with me. Really stayed with me. I was. I still think about scenes in this movie. Uh, it's one that I cannot wait to kind of dive back into and watch, watch at least once a year. It's like this meditation on legacy and accomplishment and friendship and peer groups and what do we contribute to each other? What are we trying to accomplish? Or do we hold each other back? Are we all just trapped together? No matter what we do, and it does this, and it does it beautifully because it. It's the story of these two guys that have been doing the same thing for like years, years and years and years. They're on this little Irish island of Inisherin, and uh, there's not a lot going on, not a lot of people there. So when Brennan Gleeson one day, he's kind of more of an erudite fella. He's more well-read. He's into music. He's a writer. He likes to write music as well. And uh, Colin Farrell's like a <laughs> the local yokel. He's like an idiot. He's like a dummy. And they've been good friends for years. And every day they go to the pub, etc. And uh, one day, Brennan Gleason's like, I can't be your friend. I can't be your friend anymore. Uh, you're holding me back. I'm going to die soon. I could die in the next 10 years. I haven't accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. And hanging out with you stops me from accomplishing that. And so you have to... <laughs> and then he goes to very extreme lengths as the movie goes on uh, to kind of show Colin Farrell that, leave me the fuck alone, dude. Just chill. Get the fuck away from me. Um, and then it's, it deals with that character and then also Colin Farrell's character, who is more of the lead of the movie and his kind of reaction to being told this 
and how it kind of destroys his life and destroys everything about him. But it's not just these two guys are not the only good things about this. Carrie Condon's also really great. And, per- and Barry Keoghan, I think is how you pronounce his name. Great actor. He's worked on other movies with Colin Farrell. I know he's in uh, The Sacred Killing of a Deer. Uh, he plays this this mysterious character that's bothering Colin Farrell's family in that movie. That's totally worth checking out, too. You should check it out. Greek director. Can't remember his name right now. But anyways, everybody in the movie is fantastic. It's, it has a small cast, but everybody kind of knocks it out of the park. And it's just a perfectly pitched, perfectly paced, perfectly performed movie. Uh, it's so darkly funny. F- funny in ways that like hurt your soul a little bit. Like It, it really is this beautiful meditation on relationships and what you're doing. What the fuck are you doing with your life? And that kind of existential question and the dread that comes along with understanding that your existence is finite and you might not accomplish the things you wanted to accomplish. And is it your fault or is it somebody else's fault? Is it because of the context of where you live? Like what is the answer? And uh, and the movie has a great time kind of exploring those topics and those subjects and and does it in a a brutally Irish way where it's like melancholy and funny and sad and fucked up. And uh, I had a really great time. I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Definitely check it out. Definitely watch The Banshees of Inna Sharon. Well, okay, everybody, that was my, uh, those are my best movies of 2022 and a few honorable mentions, of course, right at the top. Um, what are your best movies of 2022? If you have a list or if you've seen any, you know, drop them in the comments. I would love to read them, especially if it's stuff that's not on my list, you know? It's always cool to hear what other people are into, what they like, and, uh, and it helps me kind of explore uh, new avenues, new things I can watch. So definitely leave them in the comments, and uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll be back. Again, another day, another time. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Zoobox, there's a bunch of links in the description that will take you to all the places we go. Remember, if you're a fan of Nightcap, the show that live streams over on Odyssey and DLive, it's, uh, we do it on Saturday nights now for the time being. Just a, just a friendly reminder. But anyways, all right, everybody. You have a great day, a great night, a great week, a great month, a great year. 2023, here we go.